All right, welcome back, everyone, to our third and final program segment. Uh, we're going to hear from Massimo, followed by Shanti, and then we'll have an open mic happy hour or happy half hour, whatever remains. Uh, but the main thing will be happiness. Uh, it's a great pleasure and, and a privilege to introduce Massimo. He needs no introduction, but some of you may not be as familiar with him as you're about to be. Massimo Pigliucci is an author, blogger, podcaster, as well as K.D. Irani Professor of Philosophy at the City College of New York, and therefore uh, my congenial colleague. His academic work is in evolutionary biology, philosophy of science, the nature of pseudoscience, and practical philosophy. In fact, Massimo is one of those rare creatures who was not satisfied with the torture of doing one PhD, so he did two of them, one in biology and then one in philosophy. I mean, we know each other about 25 years, Massimo, I think going back to the days of the East Tennessee rationalists, right? That's right. That's that was correct. you and one other guy uh, in East Tennessee. No, I'm just kidding. But you've been you've been involved with philosophical practice for a very long time, and uh, you've done so much, so much. Um, Massimo's books include How to Be a Stoic, Using Ancient Philosophy to Live a Modern Life, Nonsense on Stilts, How to Tell Science from Bunk, and boy, do we ever need that these days. And his forthcoming book is The Quest for Character, What the Story of Socrates and Alcibiades Teaches Us about our search for good leaders. And that is going to be the focus of Massimo's talk today. Welcome, Massimo. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Lou. That was great. Um, so let me share my screen and get us started. Here we are. Actually, let me do one more thing. There. So yeah, the quest for character. We all talk about character. Character is, is something that we all should, or if, if we don't actually care about, uh, it is an, essentially how we behave in life, right? It's, it's the sum total of our uh, behavioral dispositions. And so if we want to improve ourselves, or if we want to uh, help improve others, then character comes to, to, the, to the foreground. And the Greco-Romans had quite a bit to say about character, as you, you all probably know. I want to tell you a few stories uh, today, but, but the main one we're going to start with is, in fact, that of Socrates and Alcibiades. I doubt Socrates needs any introduction in this group uh, or any other, really. But Alcibiades might, and he's such a fascinating character. He's really the quintessential example of a character you really don't want to be. It's the, the kind of character you don't want to have. And yet he's such a fascinating historical figure that I'm actually stunned that there hasn't been a movie or a TV series made uh, based, based on him. So imagine now that we are back into Athens around 430 uh, BCE. Socrates at this point is about 40 years old. Alcibiades is his friend, his student, possibly his lover, um, and he's about 20 years old. And just to provide you some historical context, the Peloponnesian War between Sparta and Athens uh, has just started the year before. It's going fairly well for the Athenians because they haven't been hit by a major uh, disaster in the form of a plague and, and a number of other disasters to follow. And I'll, I'll explain why all this is, is relevant actually to, to our story in a minute. This is a wonderful painting from back to 1776 of Alcibiades to the left and Socrates in, on the right trying to teach him something and unfortunately failing. Uh, the little angel there on the side of, of, of Socrates is supposed to be his daemon. Um, that, was, that was the 18th century rendition of, of it. Now, Socrates in, uh, argues in an important dialogue that I'll, I'll mention briefly in a minute that people are confused about what they don't know, not about what they have mastered. So if you know something, if you must master some kind of, of uh, you know, skill or topic, you, you, you're not confused about it. But if you are confused about something, that means that's a good indication that you don't really know what you're talking about. And so at that point, there are three possibilities. One someone has knowledge about whatever subject matter we're talking about uh, under discussion, or they don't have knowledge, but are aware of the fact that they don't have knowledge. So they're aware of the fact that they're not experts. Let's say you talk to me about quantum mechanics. I'm, I'm perfectly aware that I don't know anything about quantum mechanics. I don't pretend to, to know anything about it. And then there is the dangerous category. The people that don't have knowledge, but are unaware of their ignorance. And in fact, they think they know what they're talking about, right? 
those in the first two categories don't present a problem. Uh, one, because the first group, because they know what they're talking about. The second one, because they don't pretend to know what they're, what they're talking about. But the third one is, in fact, the one that is most problematic, especially when it comes to people that have power, when it comes to people that are politicians, statesmen, and, and people like that. And in fact, according to Socrates, uh, these people, including Alcibiades, belong to an unfortunate class that is affected by a particular kind of stupidity or a contemptible stupidity, as he calls it. The original Greek word is amatia, which literally means lack of wisdom or unwisdom. So it's the opposite of Sophia in a, in a sense. Now, in, the, uh, in Plato's Alcibiades uh, Major or, the, or, or Alcibiades I, uh, there is this bit of dialogue which I find uh, it sort of captures the whole essence of what of what uh, I'm talking about and on what the in the relationship between Alcibiades and Socrates. After Alcibiades has come to Socrates to uh, ask for suggestions for 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 a guidance uh, because he wants to become a preeminent man in, in Athens and wants to become to lead the state, uh, Socrates concludes. Then, alas, Alcibiades, what a condition you suffer from! I hesitate to name it, but since we two are alone, it must be said. You are wedded to stupidity, best of men, of the most extreme sort, as the argument accuses you and you accuse yourself. So this is why you're leaping into the affairs of the city before you have been educated. And in the same dialogue, immediately after that, Socrates tells us that that's the problem with politicians in general, not just Alcibiades. With the possible exception, he says, of, of your mentor, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, the... the, the um, uh, that, that was that raised Alcibiades. We'll, we'll talk about that in a, in, a, in a minute. But with a with few possible exceptions, most politicians fall into this problem. They have this. They suffer from this particular condition. This kind of intelligent stupidity has been as has been referred to. Now, who was Alcibiades, and why is it important in our story as a as a, a quintessential representative of a character that you really don't want to be? Plutarch, in the life of Alcibiades, says he was naturally a man of many strong passions, the mightiest of which were the love of rivalry and the love of preeminence. And let me give you just a little bit of a, of a taste of, of what Alcibiades' life actually uh, unfolded, of how it unfolded. He was born in 450 BC. Uh, he was a member of the very famous and very cursed Alcimonidae family. These were the people that had driven away the tyrant uh, Cylon in 632, but unfortunately he made the mistake of pursuing him and then killing him inside the Temple of Athena. And that's where, why they were cursed uh, for the rest of time. And Alcibiades uh, inherited that course. He was adopted by Pericles. Pericles is the, the, the person that Socrates says may be one of the, those exceptions among politicians. Maybe he does know what he's talking about, but the rest of you don't. He was a determined young boy. There are a couple of stories that Plutarch tells us about it that are fascinating. One of them is the story of the astragali. The astragali were these knuckle bones that were used by kids to play basically a variation on the play of the game of dice. And at some point, Alcibiades was playing in the streets of Athens with his friends, and he was very young. And, and the, the astragali went in the middle of the road, and there was a cart coming. And Alcibiades saw that he had a good score. So what does he do? He jumps in front of the cart and tells the, 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 the driver to stop because he needs to retrieve the astragali. And he risked, in, a sen in essence, he risks his life because he, had, he saw that he had a good, a good score, a good point. And that was very important to him, to the point of actually risking his life. Um, in the case of the, uh, uh, of the wrestling and biting episode, he was wrestling with a... With a kid who's bigger and more and stronger than he was but he had to win so he he bit the kid's uh, ear which and he was accused of being you know of fighting like a like a woman which of course at the time was a, was an insult and uh, Alcibiades response was no I was fighting like Hercules I was using anything that was that that was in my disposal in order to win uh, the, the the fight so this guy was Ever, since he was, a, was, was uh, very young, he was very determined in making a mark and having things his way. The, thing, the, the, the trend continued uh, when he became a young man and then an adult. He entered, for instance, for the first time ever as a private citizen at the Olympic Games, uh, whopping three chariots, and he placed first, second, and fourth uh, in, uh, in, the, in the race. Uh, 
Later on, he participated in the Battle of Potidea, which was very interesting because that's where Socrates actually saved his life. That's a whole other interesting um, episode. He then rises to prominence um, and uh, by by undermining the peace of Nicias, which had been that had been halting the Peloponnesian War uh, successfully. But Alcibiades thought that there was much more glory in war than in peace, and so he wasn't very happy with the peace. Then he successfully undermined it. After the hostilities resumed, the Athenians actually suffered a major uh, defeat at Mantinea, but Alcibiades was not faced by it. Uh, Discarding the advice of the older and more and more wise Nietzsche's, he actually agitated for the invasion of Sicily to opening a second front in the in the war of um, in the Peloponnesian War, and um, this eventually ended up in a, a major disaster for the Athenians. It was one of the major reasons the Athenians eventually lost the war. Uh, before he was appointed general, co-general in the invasion of Sicily in the attack against Syracuse. And, but before he departed, there was an incident involving in Athens involving the uh, uh, desecration of some, some statues. He was accused of being responsible or co-responsible, and he was arrested as soon as he got into uh, to Sicily. So what does he do? He escapes and defects to Sparta. Right. Not only that, but he advises the, Sparta, the Spartans strategically. Among other things, he told them to build a fort at a place called Desilea, which is only 10 miles from Athens. This turns out to be a major strategic defeat for the Athenians for the rest of the world, the war. But Alcibiades is not done. When he's in Sparta, he seduces and gets pregnant the, 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 the queen, the, the Spartan queen. So clearly her husband, King Aegis, is not happy about it. Uh, and his partner Amenor is sent out to kill Alcibiades. Alcibiades, of course, escapes one more time. And what does he go? He goes to the Persians and he seeks asylum with the Persian satrap Tissaphernes. He obtains, in fact, the, uh, the, the help of the, of the Persians and he starts advising them on how to defeat both Sparta and, and Athens. And he does so successfully. But then he wants to return to Athens because, you know, he's an Athenian or because he has a, the, the, that kind of ego. Um, he thinks that the democratic government in charge of Athens would not want him back. So what does he do? He organizes a coup d'etat, uh, which is successful, and at least in the short term, and leads to the so-called reign of the 400 in, in Athens. However, by a quirk of fate, Alcibiades is stuck in, on the island of Samos with the Athenian fleet, which remains loyal to the Democratic Party in Athens. And what happens? His charms is such uh, that he actually gets elected commander of the fleet, even though he has helped the government, been over to overthrow the government at home. You can see why I'm fascinated with this guy. I mean, this, this, this really ought to be a movie. Um, he promises to bring Kisaphernes to the Athenian cause, but he knows that the Persians are actually not gonna, gonna not gonna help. So he lies his way through uh, back to into the the good graces of the Athenians. He actually meets with Tissaphernes, who figures out what kind of guy this is, and he arrests him. And of course, Alcibiades uh, manages to escape and and uh, resuming command of the Athenian forces. Under that command, he actually manages to win a number of, uh, of battles and, and inflict devastating losses on the Spartans. This, mind you, is after Athens had suffered from both a plague and, a, and a, almost, the, the, almost the annihilation of their forces in Sicily. So Alcibiades really was a genius in that sense. Self-centered uh, bastard, but a genius nonetheless. He finally returns in three months to Athens in 407, but things are not done uh, yet. The following year, he's, he suffers a minor defeat in, um, in a naval battle. He's therefore re, uh, relieved of command because the Athenian democracy was pretty fickle in those kind of, of, uh, of situations. So he goes into voluntary exile. What does he do? He makes his way back again to Persia to ask for the support of King Artaxerxes. At this point, however, I think he's done one too many. Uh, and the Spartans actually send an envoy to ask the Persians to finally eliminate Alcibiades once and for all because you know, he's, he's, he's gone beyond the limit, which happens in the mountains of Phrygia in Anatolia. He's surrounded by a bunch of soldiers. He comes out yelling his battle cry and with his sword in, in, in hand, nobody dares actually engaging him in battle. 
uh, in combat, and in fact, he's he's killed by a shower of arrows that were shot up from a from a safe distance. So he died at age forty five, just five years before uh, before Socrates, in fact. And here he is, the death of Alcibiades. Now, why is it, is this important? Because, as I said, Alcibiades is an example of you know a, a quintessentially bad character for a politician, as Socrates has told us. But he's also an example of a failure by Socrates. Right? He tried to bring Alcibiades in the um, you know to teach him the, the the ways of virtue, but he completely and utterly failed. But the story in terms of Socrates is more complicated. For instance, if we compare what just happened, what we've seen happening with Alcibiades to the advice that Socrates gives to another guy, Charmides. And uh, here I'm quoting directly uh, from, from one of the, uh, from Xenophon's dialogues. Seeing that Glaucus' son, Charmides, was a respectable man and far more capable than the politicians of the day, and nevertheless shrunk from speaking in the assembly and taking a part in politics, Socrates said, tell me, Charmides, what would you think of a man who was capable of gaining a victory in the great games and consequently a winning honor for himself and adding to his country's fame in the Greek world and yet refused to compete? And, of course, Camus' response is, I should think of him as a poltroon and a coward. And he doesn't realize that Socrates is actually talking about himself. He says, you know, you do have the, the characteristics of a good politician and yet you shrink, from, shrink away from policy. You really ought to do uh, you know, your duty. He says, Socrates says, don't refuse to face this duty, then strive more earnestly to pay heed to yourself and don't neglect public affairs if you have the power to improve them. If they go well, not only the people, but your friends and you yourself, at least as much as they will profit. This is an example of Socrates really mentoring and, and nudging certain people to get into politics and nudging other people to get out of politics. So that I want another one of the the dialogues that Xenophon presents in the memorabilia is about Glaucon, who uh, was in fact uh, Carmides' father. And, and Socrates is actually discouraging uh, Glaucon from getting into, into politics because he doesn't think that he has what he's done. So Socrates, in a sense, has been playing this, this interesting role of not only a direct mentor to some people, and sometimes you know, it worked and sometimes it didn't work, but also of nudging people that he thought were virtuous toward politics and nudging away people that he didn't think were virtuous uh, from politics. Now, in the case of communist things, unfortunately, don't go very well. He does get into politics, but he has the misfortune of serving under the so-called 30 tyrants. Uh, and he then dies in a battle in uh, Munichia in 403 BCE. So, but the problem, the, the point is the, the clear vision that Socrates actually has of his own role here, right? At one point, we're told that uh, a friend of Socrates, Antiphon, remarks that Socrates is in no position to make politicians uh, of others because he's himself not a politician. To which Socrates responds, how now, Antiphon? Should I play a more important part in politics by engaging in them alone or by taking pains to turn out as many competent politicians as possible? Right. So he's aware of the fact that there is a role for the philosopher here, and the role is not necessarily to become a politician himself, because he may not have what it takes to do to do so, um, but rather to mentor or to nudge other people in doing the right thing and getting involved. Overall, Socrates has three answers to the question of the relationship between politics and, and philosophy, which is one of the major themes that, that my book is concerned with. Um, a philosopher can encourage or discourage poli pot potential politicians. Com you can contrast the case of Alcibiades and that of Carmides. A philosopher can teach a wannabe politician, or can try to at least. And a politician ought to be a philosopher. Of course, philosopher here, uh, in, in scare quotes, means not somebody like Lou and I most of the times that is an academic who publishes technical papers. It means somebody who lives philosophy, who uses philosophy as a way, as a way of life. Which brings us to the obvious next question, which has often been debated in the context of, of Socrates and Socratic, the Socratic approach, which is whether virtue can be taught. Because the whole premise here seems to be that if we are in the business of either advising other people or trying to improve ourselves in terms of character, that means that we are assuming 
that character can be improved. In other words, that virtue can be taught, that it is some kind of tech, uh, of skill that can be taught. Now, is that the case or not? Well, that depends on who you ask. Uh, Seneca, for instance, a Stoic philosopher of the early part of the uh, middle part of the first century, says virtue is nothing else than right reason, which means that uh, if you reason correctly, you actually are virtuous. So Seneca thought that absolutely virtue can be taught. Uh, and in particular, can, it can be taught through the exercise and it can, uh, of the four so-called four cardinal virtues, which are often associated with Stoicism, but in fact go back to Plato. They're found, they're first listed in Plato's Republic. And there's four virtues, which are like every virtue, a, a character, uh, aspect of one's character and a behavioral disposition are prudence, sometimes referred to as practical wisdom. That's the ability to navigate complex ethical situations in the best way possible. Justice, which is understood typically as, as uh, acting toward others by respecting them and by treating them as human beings. Fortitude or courage, uh, which includes things like endurance and the ability to confront our own fears. And then temperance, which is the ability to do things in the right measure, neither too much nor, nor too little. Now, the word virtue comes, of course, from the Latin virtus, which itself, however, it's a translation of the Greek, Greek arete, and it simply means excellence. So what we're talking about here is that by if, if we're talking about being virtuous, we're just talking about being the best human being that we can be. Now, you might be wondering why not showing that knife over there uh, within, in a somewhat threatening uh, fashion. And the reason for that is because the word arete actually, or excellence, is applicable in general, not just to, to what we call virtue. Uh, anything can be can possess arete in the in terms of the specific uh, uh, goals or purposes that that thing or individual has, and so you can talk about, for instance, uh, arete for a knife. What is arete for a knife? It's an it's the knife that cuts very well. It is very sharp. Similarly, a human being, in according to the Socratic tradition, has possesses arete if it does well what human beings are supposed to be doing well, which is what live together with other human beings, being social and cooperative with other human beings. So excellence or virtue in a human being uh, is it, the ability to, as I said, re relate in a constructive, positive fashion to others. How do we know this? Well, that's because, again, uh, if we look at etymologically at, at, the, at the topic of our conversation here, the word ethics comes from the Greek kathos, which Cicero translated as moralis in Latin. And both words refer to both having a good character and uh, to one's ability uh, for social living. Because if you have a good character, then you have a good ability for social, for social living. And vice versa, an ability for social living requires a good character. So that's what we're, what we're talking about. Now, is this, again, uh, something that we can teach or, or not, we'll get to that in a, in a minute. Right? So an excellent human being is an ethical or moral human being. And here I'm using the words ethics and morality as essentially synonyms, as, as they were meant originally. What does that mean in turn? It means that someone is a good human being, is an excellent human being, if, if it works on her or his character in order to live better and more harmoniously with other human beings. Now... Socrates is of two minds, notoriously, about whether we can teach virtue or not. In the meno, for instance, he says, he seems to indicate that we cannot. Uh, the meno at 70a uh, starts out near, near the beginning of the meno. We, we, we find the following. Can you tell me, Socrates, in you, is human excellence something teachable? Or if not teachable, it is, uh, is it something to be acquired by training? Or if it cannot be acquired either by training or by teaching, does it accrue to me at birth or in some other way? So the, the general uh, idea here is, where does, what do we do with this, with this uh, uh, virtue thing? Do we learn it? Do we inherit it? Do we, is, it, is it innate or what? And Socrates in that dialogue considers a number of possibilities, but then he concludes that if, if virtue were in fact teachable, then you would see around teachers of wisdom. And he doesn't see any around. He says there are some people that pretend to be, to be teachers of wisdom, like the, the sophists, particularly gorgeous, but um, 
but he doesn't see that as actually happening. So he seems to be concluding that virtue is not teachable. And if that were the case, then I could stop right here because there'll be no point in discussing uh, any further the possibility of improving either ourselves or our, or our leaders. But it turns out that in a different dialogue, the Protagoras, Socrates actually arrives at a completely opposite conclusion. He, he arrives at the conclusion that, teach, that virtue can, in fact, be taught. And the interesting thing is that he's convinced by this by Protagoras, by a sophist. And Protagoras produces a number of, of interesting arguments in, in that dialogue uh, to the effect that virtue can be taught. But one of the, uh, these arguments, one of the most compelling arguments that, that to which Socrates responds uh, includes a, a following, the following thought experiment. Uh, Protagoras says, you know, imagine we, are, we live in a town where somehow our survival depends on everybody being able to play in the flute. Now, what would what, would, what do you think would happen? Well, we would make a lot of efforts, presumably, to teach everybody how to play the flute. Now, some people, of course, would be better at teaching the flute. Some, some people will have you know, a natural uh, tendency and, and your musical ability, and they will do better. But everybody, as a result of being taught, would improve. And therefore, the chances of the town uh, uh, to survive would be, would be in, in, improved. Well, the analogy, of course, is that the chances for a, for a society to live, to survive, to, to prosper, uh, depend on how virtuous their citizens, its citizens are. And uh, what we should try to do, therefore, is to teach as much as possible. And in the same way um, as it, with musical abilities, some people will be more naturally prone to be cooperative and, and altruistic and so on and so forth. And others will have to be taught, but we will improve everybody's ability to do so. That's why, says Protagoras, it's so important, therefore, to teach virtue, especially to the next generation. According to him, uh, virtue is something like flute playing. So it's a kind of practical skill, a techne, and therefore it can be taught. And as I said, it turns out that this actually convinces Socrates at the, by the end of the, di the dialogue. The techne, the notion of virtuous techne, is distinct from that of episteme or a more, more uh, uh, theoretical type of knowledge, analogous to our modern science, which even Socrates already agrees, can, of course, be taught. So the end of the, of the story is, yes, uh, virtue can be taught. Well, if virtue can be taught, do we have examples historically uh, or nowadays of actual success in teaching our leaders in particular, teaching politicians and statesmen virtue? Well, the record is mixed shall we say. Um, and I'll go very briefly through some examples um, before we get to the modern evidence about, about this topic. One great example is the efforts made by Plato that are recounted in his seventh letter. And these are the efforts of teaching the tyrant of Syracuse, Dionysus II, in fact, also his father, Dionysus I. And Plato has to be commanded. I mean, I don't know how many people actually know this story, but Plato needs to be commanded. He was already in his 60s, an old man by, by the standards of the time, when he decided to do what he says here in this letter that, I'm, that I put on the screen. I pondered the matter and was in two, uh, in two minds as to whether I ought to listen to entreaties and go, go to Syracuse to try to make uh, Dionysus virtuous, or how I ought to act. And finally, to the scale turned in favor of the view that if ever anyone was to try to carry out in, pra in practice my ideas about laws and constitutions, now was the time for making the attempt. As we would say today, he put his money where his mouth was. Enough of the theory, enough of teaching the, 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 how things should be, that we have a chance, Plato had a chance uh, to actually make a difference. So he gets on a, on a ship, and to make a long story short, he actually twice risks his, uh, losing his life, one under Dionysus I and one under Dionysus II, because these people were not exactly good material uh, for, being, for being, becoming virtuous um, Virtuous rulers. This is Dionysus II here, uh, in a in a famous uh, presenting in a famous painting. Nevertheless, Plato doesn't give up, and he actually hooks up with a guy named Dion of Syracuse, who uh, turns out to be a really good student. Uh, he's actually responding very well to uh, to Plato's teachings. He says Plato himself says he rapidly assimilated my teaching as he did all forms of knowledge. 
and he listened with eagerness to whatever I had to say, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it turns out that Dion eventually does become the leader of Syracuse and pretty much comes as close as anybody has ever come to uh, instantiate the kind of government that uh, the kind of, of, of social arrangement that uh, Plato was actually um, was theorizing for most for most of his career. Uh, eventually, of course, he was assassinated because no good deed goes unpunished, um, and uh, the whole the whole uh, experiment came to an end. Uh, but here we have at least one case of Plato unsuccessfully trying to teach virtue to two leaders and successfully to a third one. We have plenty of other examples. I will not tell you the, the details of the stories, uh, but we have plenty of other examples in antiquity. Let me just remind you uh, of a few of these. We have, of course, Aristotle teaching Alexander the Great, and people have argued, and I go into some detail in my uh, about this in my in my book, that Alexander learned pretty well. In fact, he learned. Uh, even a little too well, because um, Aristotle was trying to um, nudge Alexander uh, to build a sort of a Pan-Hellenistic uh, world, a Pan-Hellenistic league of, of you know, all Greek cities. And Alexander fought in cosmopolitan terms, bigger terms. He wanted the entire world to be uh, uh, you know, united under, un, under his banner. But there are a lot of details in Alexander's life that really end career, that really reflect the teachings of Aristotle, for good or for were ill, of course. Another example is Seneca's attempt to teach the Emperor Nero. Now, we all know how that ended. Um, you know, Nero ordered uh, Seneca to commit suicide, uh, which he did in a kind of a Socratic, Socratic fashion. What a lot of people don't realize, however, is that the caricature version of that story that we, we hear most often, it's actually not true. It turns out that at least for the first five years of Nero's reign, things were actually very good. Um, historians refer to that as the Quinquennium Neronis, uh, during which uh, Rome actually prospered and Seneca was able to steer uh, uh, Nero in the right direction together with, with the help of the prefect of the Praetorian Guard, the two of them really did a pretty good job. But then at some point, Nero really began to be more and more an inch. Then in fact, at that point, Seneca realized that that was the case, and he tried to retire. In fact, he tried to, to bribe basically the emperor with giving away most of his fortune. Uh, Seneca was pretty wealthy. Uh, in order to be, be allowed to retire, but that didn't work out because Nero really needed uh, Seneca at, at court. So that's another story that started out pretty well, didn't that, didn't that very, uh, very well. Uh, there are other stories, Cicero and Cato, for instance. Cato the Younger was a major Stoic and, and uh, Roman politician near the end of um, the Republic. And here we have how Cicero characterizes him in a friend in a, in a letter to his friend uh, Atticus. He says, as for our friend Cato, you do not love him more than I do. But after all, with the very best intentions and the most absolute honesty, he sometimes does harm to the Republic. He speaks and votes as though he were in the Republic of Plato, not in the scum of Rom Romulus. And it's a, the contrast between the two of them is incredible. We have Cato, who was the Stoic uh, politician, who was very rigid in his philosophy and in his and the practice of his philosophy. He was so well regarded that in Rome, when somebody did something wrong, in order to excuse themselves, they will say, "Well, not everybody can be a Cato." So imagine to be that kind of paragon of, of virtue. But he was so inflexible in his philosophy and in his application of the philosophy to his politics. Uh, that he arguably, you know, Cicero is right. Arguably, he did more more damage than anything else um, in in his career at uh, in terms of uh, the fate of the republic. Now contrast that with Cicero, who was a philosopher, a politician, and a lawyer, and therefore very pragmatically oriented. Uh, and here he is presented at the apex of his career. He's on the left in the middle of the Senate. Uh, at the apex of his career, when he successfully denounces and towards Catiline's uh, conspiracy against the Roman Republic. So here we have somebody whose politics is very much informed by his philosophy. Uh, Cicero, uh, although he was very sympathetic to the Stoics, thought of himself as a, as a skeptic, as an academic skeptic. But his philosophy was very much informing his life and his, and his politics. And at least for some of his life, he did succeed in implementing, in really behaving as um, in, in a virtuous and yet pragmatic, uh, pragmatic fashion.
Then, of course, we have the, the example of Marcus Aurelius, one of the five good emperors who managed a number of crises uh, during his reign uh, uh, that affected the Roman Empire. And by all accounts, did very well by, again, very consciously applying uh, his philosophy, in this case, Stoicism, to the way he conducted his affairs. We know a lot of, of the details about what he is thinking uh, because, of course, we have his personal diary uh, in the form of what is known as the Meditations. And then finally, we have Julian, known as the Apostate. This was one of the last Roman emperors, shooting the last pagan Roman emperor who tried to uh, you know, uh, reverse the tide of, of Christianity and failed. And that's why he's referred to by Christians as the apostate. But Julian also was a philosopher in the sense, again, not of just a scholar, but of somebody who was consciously trying to apply his philosophy, in his particular case, a form of Neoplatonism, uh, to the conduct of his life. And by all account, again, uh, he, again he was, in fact, a good ruler, a good, a good statesman. There are plenty of other examples in, in ancient history and uh, uh, on, in more, more recent history uh, as well, although my book concerns most, mostly the Greek Romans. But I want to conclude by bringing the discussion up to, to the modern times, to, to the 21st century, and ask a fundamental question, which is, assuming that we can improve character, as Socrates seemed to agree at some point, and has... Uh, and that is the basis, the basic assumption of what, most of what we do, uh, in, including in, in, our, in our careers as, as philosophical counselors. Uh, what does modern science say about this? Uh, are there things that do work or do not work in order to improve our own character and also, therefore, in order to help others improve their characters, which is what I've been talking about most, most, for most of the last half an hour, 40 minutes? Well, it turns out that the Greek Romans there too got it pretty much right, uh, although of course they did not have the kind of systematic quantitative research that we have available today. Uh, and if you're interested in the details of that of this research, I highly recommend reading *The Character Gap* by Christian Miller, who has devoted uh, his career to studying empirically uh, the issue of character and how it can be improved. Now, modern science tells us that there are some things that don't work and there are some things that actually do work uh, when, when it comes to improving character. Let's start with what does not work. Doing nothing doesn't work. Now, this may not be surprising, right? like doing nothing usually doesn't work. But the assumption often is that, in fact, just by doing nothing, we would become better people. Uh, we hear that, that said that wisdom comes with aging, right? You just get older, you accumulate experience, and therefore you become more wise. Well, no. Uh, what happens is that you become more wise if you mindfully and critically reflect on your experiences. But if you just accumulate passively those experiences, that's not going to help. In fact, as I said, the research is pretty clear. Wisdom requires active uh, participation, active critical reflection, not just the passage of time. So doing nothing is not an option. Virtue labeling is not an option. This is something that has been trendy uh, over the last several years, especially in certain academic quarters. But telling someone that they are honest, conscientious, or whatever, while in fact they're not, uh, doesn't work. Uh, it is infantilizing, uh, for one thing, uh, and it doesn't actually obtain any results. You don't, you don't become the person you're, lab you're labeled by others uh, to be. Nudging also doesn't seem to work. Uh, this is referred to sometimes as libertarian paternalism. And this is the notion that you can behaviorally manipulate people basically in certain ways so that they act in, in the way that you want. Now, that works in certain practical respects. Uh, those of you who, are, who go um, to uh, men's uh, toilets at the, at the airport might have seen urinals marked with a little fly that you're supposed to be hitting uh, when, you, when you do your thing. Well, that works. The fly is there in order to uh, convince people uh, behaviorally, nudging them toward doing the right thing and not a mess all over the floor. And it does work. What it doesn't work, however, is when you're trying to improve people's characters uh, by way of similar manipulations, because, of course, you're robbing them of their agency. Improving character means that you, it is something you ought to be doing to want to be doing yourself not something that you're manipulated passively by by other people into doing so nudging also doesn't work 
What does work? Here too, there are three major strategies. And interestingly to me, these strategies are actually found in the ancient Greek Romans. One is adopting Rome models. Uh, it turns out that if you adopt a, one or more role models, if you think of your grandmother watching over you or Socrates watching over you or your daemon watching over you, whatever it is, uh, then actually you will be nudging yourself, actively nudging yourself toward doing the, same, the, the right thing. And we have examples and suggestions such as this one uh, from the ancients here, Seneca, for instance, in one of his letters to his friend Lucilius, where he says... Choose, therefore, as your role model, a Cato. That's the Cato that I've just been talking about, by the way. Or if Cato seems too severe, a model, choose some Valerius, a gentle spirit. Choose a master whose life, conversation, and solo expressing phase have satisfied you. Picture him always to yourself as your protector or your pattern. For we must indeed have someone according to whom we may regulate our characters. You can never straighten that which is crooked unless you use a ruler. The second thing that works is to, uh, on purpose, uh, seeking or avoiding uh, situations that will test your character. For instance, don't agree on a, to go on a date with a fl flirtatious colleague if you are in a long-term relationship already and you're happy with that relationship. Just say no from the beginning. Don't say, oh, I'm going to go, but I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be able to handle the situation. Because it turns out that people are not able to handle situations once they expose themselves. Uh, to such situations. In uh, uh, the, the Greco-Romans insisted that we have the resources to resist temptation, essentially, to avoid especially temptation. Here's Epictetus, a Stoic philosopher from the second century, who says, provoked by the sight of a handsome man or a beautiful woman, you will discover within you the contrary power of self-restraint. Faced with pain, you will discover the power of endurance. If you're insulted, you will discover patience. In time, you will grow to be confident that there is not a single impression that you will not have the moral means to tolerate. But modern science tells us that the best way to tolerate impressions of the kinds that Epictetus is talking about is simply to avoid them. Uh, just, just get away from it as much as possible. The best way to resist temptation is not to expose yourself to temptation. And then finally, the third thing that works in order to improve character is actually paying attention. So, so it turns out, again, empirically, that once we actually start paying attention to our noticing our habits or our cognitive biases, we actually counter them. We begin to counter them. We all suffer from cognitive biases and, and bad habits. But once we are able to identify them and reflect on them, then we actually begin to improve. And this is why one of the ancient um, standard techniques for self-improvement was the philosophical journaling. Uh, here is the, the technique is explained by Epictetus again. He says, we should have each judgment ready at the moment when it is needed. Judgments on dinner at dinner time, on the bath and bathing time, on bed at bed time. And how do we do that? Well, admit not sleep into your tender eyelids until you have reckoned up each deed of the day, however erred, what done or left undone. So start and so review your acts, and then for vile deeds, chide yourself for good, be glad. What Epictetus is saying basically is to go over the kinds of mistakes you've done and the kinds of good things you've done and notice them, pay attention to them. Once you start noticing patterns, that is the, the beginning of self-correction. So at the end of this old long story, what have we learned? The following, I think. First of all, characters does matter, both in our everyday life, I think, and especially at, at levels of you know, political engagements. For instance, think about the upcoming elections and think what kind of people you would like to be to see at the helm of, uh, of the country or not to see at the helm of the country. Maybe you prefer Cato to Alcibiades, for instance. Second, character can be improved uh, and people have pretty much hinted at that or agreed to that from uh, Socrates and Protagoras on. And this can be done regardless of one's initial natural aptitude. Some, some of us, as I said, are more, pro more prone to certain positive pro-social behaviors. Other, some others, for some other people, this requires more effort and more mindful effort. It takes hard work, but it can be done. Some strategies, as we've seen, as we've seen uh, are and others are not effective uh, if the goal is to improve our character. And knowing which, which strategies work and which strategies don't work is, of course, a very useful uh, piece of, of, of information. 
fourth Socrates or Socrates Plato or Plat Platsoc, as is sometimes referred to, was in fact right. Only philosophers should be politicians if, of course, by philosophers, as I said, we mean people who mindfully try to do their best and to act, act ethically, not just uh, academics. And finally, everyone should be a philosopher in that sense, not just, we don't want just statements and politicians to be, to have a good character. We all want to develop a better character because we all want to live in a better society. And remember Protagoras' analogy uh, with the flute playing uh, town, if everybody were to, to make an effort, of course, this would be a significantly better world than it is. Thanks very much for your attention. Lou, I think you're in charge. Thank you very much, Massimo. I'm, I'm only in, in charge of a few seconds here on Zoom. I, I want to thank you for yet another lucid and informative presentation. Really great stuff. And I look forward to your book as well. As to all this rash of interesting books we're seeing today that are in the throes of being published. Uh, could we have uh, a great round of applause virtually uh, for Massimo? And if you can all sustain that for a minute, I'm going to take another picture. Okay, so this is all going to be uh, used, you know, for our group photo, which will be too big to fit on a screen. But thank you very much, Massimo, for another wonderful presentation.